And I'm especially glad to be able to introduce Sarah Weddington tonight, and I'll say something more formal about her in a minute. But uh, when she came to Wheaton, she would very kindly sort of ask me if there was anything she could do in return for being here for me. And I said that I really could use some help learning how to be a better public speaker. And Sarah is, as you will soon see, is an expert public speaker. So she did a few things that you may not be able to tell, but I am better. <laughs> uh, first of all, she went to the first commencement uh, when she was here in 1981, and she listened to everything I said, and afterwards she tore me to shreds. It was just terrible. And one of the things she said that I'm trying to do better about today is that if you want your audience to hear anything important that you have to say, you need to spend between a quarter and a third of your allotted time making some contact with them before you say anything important. So I'm trying to do that. <laughs> she also taught me another thing, which we'll see what she can do with, and that is we practiced one time with a video camera, and we were pretending I was on a TV talk show, and she was the host, Tess. And she introduced me, and she said, oh, we're so happy tonight to have with us President Emerson from that little girl's school in Norton, blah, blah, blah. She's going <laughs> to talk about career planning, and she knew that career planning was what I wanted to talk about. So, of course, I started right out and answered the question about career planning, and she said, you let that introduction by. How could you do that? You can't let somebody say those things about you in an introduction and just ignore it. You've got to go back and say, it's not a little women's school or a little girl's school in Norton. Anyway, she taught me introductions mattered. Now I have to introduce her. <laughs> I'm not too sure how this is going to work. But um, in the late 60s and early 70s, before I came to Wheaton, I was the Dean of Students at the University of Pennsylvania. And at that time, as at times before and times since, there were from time to time women students who got pregnant by accident and didn't want to have a baby. And at that time, in the late 60s and early 70s, it was not legal to have these women were unable to get legal abortions anywhere unless they went to New York State. In addition, in Massachusetts at that time, it was not possible to buy any birth control devices. Now you think about your lives, guys. It would be different if you couldn't have any access to birth control and there was no possibility of abortion. One person changed that, Sarah Weddington. She'll tell you more about how she did it, but let me tell you a little bit about how she came to do it. Sarah was born in Abilene, Texas. She was the daughter of a Methodist minister. Her family traveled to and lived in many small towns in West Texas. She was a very good doobie. She played in the choir, she sang in the choir, she played the piano and the organ in church. She was part of the youth groups. How would you ever know she'd turn into this? Well, <laughs> she was very bright. She graduated from high school, skipping several grades, and finished college, McMurray College in Abilene, um, when she was only 19. She went to law school at the University of Texas, something which her professors at McMurray College told her no woman should had ever done, go to, go to law school, and uh, graduated at the age of 21. And she was 25 the first time she argued Roe versus Wade in front of the Supreme Court. Think about that. As she may tell you, her prior legal experience was minimal. She had done a few wills, a few friendly divorces, and an adoption for an uncle. That was it. She's really an amazing person. Um, her, her connection, her compassion, her amazing caring about 
the rights and opportunities for women, starting early, early, when she was very young and going till today and tomorrow is pretty hard to match anywhere in our country. I think that uh, she was, in the Carter administration, the first woman who really pushed hard for opportunities for women to be appointed, for opportunities for women to be heard, uh, that we've had in national government. And it's probably very hard for anybody here who's a student to imagine that there was none of that opportunity as recently as your parents were in college, which is quite a thing. Uh, she, after she finished her term at, at the White House was when she came to Wheaton in 1981. She was here for three semesters, I think, um, staying at the president's house, teaching and lecturing, being a presence on campus, something that was very welcome and very important to students at that time. She then returned to Texas and found many ways in which she could be an important presence both in Texas politics and national politics. She's a speaker who goes everywhere uh, around the world talking about leadership in particular and women's opportunities uh, and needs and is now back here again and I'm very happy to introduce you to Sarah Weddington. Thank you. Thank you very much. to tell you my only problem with that first commencement was she read it. <laughs> Didn't she do a great job tonight? <laughs> she is a star pupil. Uh, and Pam Al, who is one of the graduates of Wheaton, who encouraged me always and came and picked me up at the Boston airport when I was flying in and flying out. Uh, today picked me up at the Providence, Rhode Island um, Airport, and it's great to see former students. Uh, Jay Goodman, who's one of the people that let me teach his class for a day and later told me what I had done wrong. <laughs> um, just lots of happy memories here. And so I'm very grateful to your president, Dale Marshall, for extending the invitation and being such a gracious hostess. I think it is appropriate that I be here as part of the Jane Ruby lecture series because she was a historian and interested in history. I was introduced not long ago on a different campus as being historic. <laughs> now, that's a funny feeling. <laughs> and yet I realized that so much of the time period that I was fortunate to live in and be able to have an impact in is historic. Now, as I said to a special group of the Wheaton family at dinner just before we came over here, I'm always conscious that I learn so much from students. It's why I continue to teach, and I love teaching. It's because I see in you all people who will run a faster, stronger, greater distance. There, as you re may remember, when um, one of the comedians of the past died, he was 100. But when he was 96, it was George Burns, he said, I can do anything today I did when I was 18. And then he said, it just goes to show how pathetic I was when I was 18. <laughs> but you who are 18, 19, 20, 21, have experienced more, been in more places, had more exposure to all kinds of learning than I ever did at your age. And so I think you will run a faster, stronger race. You will go a greater distance. And it's an honor to be able to share what wisdom I have accumulated in these experiences, in these years of learning, and to try to leave you with some things you want from me, some things I want you to have, and hopefully with a challenge, because so much of what the future holds 
you will determine. I'll never forget that first commencement here at Wheaton. All the senior traditions. But the last night before graduation was one where we all gathered at the pond and the seniors had candles in styrofoam, which they lit at the end of the evening and floated out into the pond. And I often think that when I'm speaking or appearing or working with students, I am true to that Wheaton tradition of trying to light a candle through words and send it out to others. And so I appreciate your being here tonight. I'm going to try to speak for approximately 40 minutes, and Ashley, you just happen to be where I can see you and you have a watch. Would you time me? So this means 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, 40 minutes. And then we'll have some time for question and answer. Some women are born leaders. Now, I don't mean that in the sense of saying that leaders are born leaders. I think they become leaders through experience, through training, through opportunities. But there was a time when the leadership of women was so, was recognized in the absence instead of in the person. Uh, I can still remember history again. Uh, that when I was in high school, I played basketball. But when we played basketball, we were allowed to run half court. Six of our team on one end, six on the other. You got two dribbles. After that, it was called traveling, a technical violation. And so we would go dribble, dribble, throw the ball. And the next person went dribble, dribble, throw the ball. And dribble, dribble, throw the ball. We got to center court. We threw it to somebody on the other end of the court, our team. And they went dribble, 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 dribble you know, two at a time to make that goal. And I was one of those women saying, why can't we just keep running? And they would say, oh no, all that bounding and jiggling and rebounding. <laughs> you could hurt your innards. <laughs> well, now we know women can run full court and the Olympics and professional basketball and all kinds of sports activities in the most marvelous way. Or when I was in college, I was going to be, I was going to teach eighth graders to love Beowulf. Uh, <laughs> I tried it and I went to graduate school. <laughs> um, now I have great respect for eighth grade teachers, but I should be in college and that's where I love teaching. But at that point, if you were a teacher woman and became pregnant, you were forced to quit because women were not allowed to be pregnant in the classroom. It was only in the 70s we passed the laws that said you can't fire women as teachers in public schools simply because they're pregnant. And it took a while longer, but then a national law was passed saying that if you're a larger employer, 50 or more, you cannot fire women. It was during that period when I was trying to decide what graduate school to go to that I did, as you heard, go to the dean of my college and say, I think I want to go to law school. And he said, you can't. And I said, why not? I have really good grades. And he said, yes, but it would be too tough. No woman from this college has ever gone to law school. So you know the very moment I decided I was going <laughs> to law school. Ended up with five women in my law school class of 250. Now at almost all law schools, it would be 48, 52% women, but very much a parity now. At that time, not so true. And in fact, women had a really hard time getting grades. I mean, getting their jobs, after, even if they got good grades. So the senior, the last year of law school, third year, the woman who ran the placement office was upset because no firm had ever paid a woman's way to interview. They paid the male students, not the woman, women's. And so she said to some of the firms, you either pay for a woman to go interview or you can't come here anymore. Very courageous stand. And so one of the firms decided after she explained it to them that they would like to pay a woman's way to interview. So I was the first woman at the UT Law School ever to have her way paid to interview, and they paid for me to fly from Austin to Dallas. <laughs> but it met her qualifications. And during that day, the head, of the, law the head of the law firm said things like, women have to be home to cook dinner for their husbands. Lawyers have to work late. How could, how could you do both? Uh, to train a young lawyer, we have to be able to cuss them out. We can't cuss you. You're a woman. Uh, you know, major objections. Um, and I did not get the job. But 15 years later, that particular senior partner who was in charge of my interview wanted to be a federal judge. 
There were three people who had to sign off. Me. <laughs> the Attorney General of the United States and the Congressional Liaison for the Carter Administration. You know, my mother always said you should be nice to everyone. You never know where you'll see them again. And his mother should have told him that. <laughs> But I have had the good fortune to be part of some really exciting times. As I look back and think about how do we get more men and women to be involved in leadership, and especially to help women overcome the barriers they may be for them, which are a little higher, how do we do that? There are three principles I want to talk about. The first is course correction. Because I believe that life is a series of course corrections, and I want to talk about that. Second, I think the way to prepare yourself as a leader is practice and the use of critical eye. And the third is to find something that you care deeply about. But you can be a leader before you know exactly what it is. And I'm going to talk some about Roe versus Wade because that is something students all over the country want me to talk about, and I'm happy to do so. Course correction. Does anybody ever say to you, what are you going to be when you leave college? How many of you have had that experience? <laughs> and what do you tell them? I have a rough idea. I'm not sure. Yeah. That's how, how many of you are not entirely sure? Most people, because the truth is, life is a series of course corrections. And so, as Jonah says, you know, if I look back, I thought I'd go in one direction, and then something would happen, and I'd make a difference, and then I'd make a change. So I think of course correction as simply the principle that while you're here in school, you are, you are doing something that I call answering the question, what can I do today that give me more options in the future? And education will give you more options. Knowing the world from an international perspective will give you more options. And I met people earlier who have a background in China, a background in India, an interest in Russia, uh, and many others. It's, it's so important in this world that you have that international perspective. What can I do today that will give me more options in the future? No more people. Because just as we were talking about that Tish gave me this opportunity because of a mutual friend, and your president is here in part because of people she met through Tish, that networking is so important. Or if I say, what can you do today that give you more options for tomorrow, it would be communication skills. Now, frankly, y'all know a lot of things I don't, and I'm trying to learn. Um, for example, um, you know how to do the network. You know how to put together websites. You know, I mean, if I need some help with my computer, do I call my friends? No, they don't know anything about it. I call my students. And they come over, take pity on me, and fix whatever it is. In fact, one of the moments that I will always remember is I had gone a year and a half ago um, I like to go places before McDonald's gets there. So I had gone, I had gone to Laos, Vietnam, Cambodia, and Burma for my holiday vacation. I'd already been to Thailand and some other places. And I was in Luang Prabang, Laos, little town. It's UNESCO has named it a World Cultural Heritage Site, and they're trying to preserve it in the old way. And on one particular corner, there were some more modern things. But I was out one morning at 6 o'clock because the bells rang at 6 for the monks to come out and receive rice in their begging bowls. And the vulnerable, venerable line of monks, the oldest in front in the saffron robes, were coming down in a procession. And I took a picture. And as I looked at it later, I realized in the background was the Internet Cafe. <laughs> It was the place I had the easiest time communicating with my office because the kids there, young people, could show me how to do it. Now, once I got to Burma and Cambodia, they didn't want you to communicate. And so the government was really trying to keep anyone from having access to the Internet. But you all are going to be, you are going to know more, and you certainly teach me. Course correction. 
If you had said to me at an earlier age, what are you going to be? I would have said, as you know, teach eighth graders to love Beowulf. And then I went to law school, and if you had said to me, what are you going to do? I would have said, I'm going to practice law in some little Texas town. But I couldn't get a job with a law firm. So I eventually ended up working for my English professor because I was a good writer and he needed help writing and researching. If you had said to me while I was doing that, what are you going to do next, I would have honestly said, I don't know, I just hope I can find a job. But what happened was a group of women, some men helping them, at the University of Texas in Austin campus came and said, Sarah, we've got trouble and we need help. And I said, what's the problem? And they said, the problem is that in Texas, abortion is illegal except to save the life of the woman. There are no exceptions except that one. And what's happening is a lot of women are ending up in back alleys or ending up trying a self-abortion. And they're ending up in desperate situations. We need your help to try to change this law. What can we do? Can we tell women the good places to go? Or would we be prosecuted as accomplices? Now, I didn't know the answer to that question, but I told him I'd go to the library and look it up. And we'll pick up that story in a few minutes. Ended up doing Roe versus Wade. While I was working on Roe versus Wade, I decided to run for the legislature because I didn't know if I could win or lose. And I had been a clerk typist for the Texas legislature after I graduated from college and before I started into law school. And I was watching all men except for one woman on the floor of the Texas House, and I thought, I can do that, and hopefully a little better. And so I decided I had to run for the legislature, first woman ever elected from Austin, Travis County. Now, if you had said to me then, what are you going to do next, I would have said, I'm staying right here. And then I got a call from a friend who had gone to work at the Agriculture Department in Washington, and he said, why don't you come and work for Jimmy Carter? And I said, oh, no, I'm going to stay in Texas. And he said, Sarah, talk to your friends there. This is a great opportunity. There is so much policy to be made. This is going to be such an exciting period for the nation. You have got to come. And so I talked to my friends, and they said, Sarah, Washington is a place with no country and Western music, no barbecue, no Mexican food. It's not civilized. <laughs> but I ended up going. Had a great year was general counsel for the Forest Service. And while there's lots of debate about their policies now, at the time we were there, I think their policies were really good. Got to do wild and scenic river litigation. Uh, you know, all the issues about food, food safety, uh, extra help for people in rural areas, loved it. Got a call one day from the White House saying, why don't you come work in the White House? And I said, oh no, I'm gonna stay at agriculture. And then, Mrs. Carter called and said, why don't you come have lunch at the White House? I never left. <laughs> Best job I ever had. You know, it was having that office above the Oval Office, weekends at Camp David, flying Air Force One, dinner with Margaret Thatcher when she was in town. You know, the little things that make a job interesting. <laughs> but in 1981, my team lost. And so we had six weeks, a little bit more than that. We had about two months to clean out the White House in terms of our materials. So all of our materials for Jimmy Carter went to Atlanta, Georgia for his library. You know that the first President Bush, his went to College Station, Bryan College Station. Uh, President Reagan's went out to California. President Nixon went out to his um, place where he and his wife are buried. Um, and I've been there because I'm very interested in presidents. Um, and so we had a little time to clean up and close out. Usually when we came to work in the White House on the left would be a picture gallery. It would be the picture of the president with the U.S. hockey team when they beat the Russians. It would be the, president of the, pic uh, the picture of the president with the president of Egypt, the prime minister of Israel when they signed the Camp David Accords. Whatever was big and you'd come to work and just feel so good. The day after the election we came to work there were no pictures. Instead there was an article someone had posted entitled 50 things you can make for Christmas for less than $5. <laughs> and it was appropriate. The last day of an administration is Inauguration Day. That day, those who've worked for the outgoing president come to work, get your last Rolodex or whatever, 
I guess you'd get your Palm Pilot. And out the back gates at 11 o'clock go the people who work for the departing president. Because in through the front gates at 11 o'clock come the new people who will work for the new president. And you don't want the two to have a chance to clash. And the other is the departing president gets a last trip home on Air Force One. So the president who will take off from Andrews for that last trip home, you don't want to go with no one to wave. So the outgoing staffers for that president are sent out to Andrews, and they are the people in the background waving as the plane takes off. In the residence, slightly different. The last of the departing president's things don't go to Andrews until the oath of office is given, because we always have a president in place ready to act at any moment. But once the oath of office is given, departing president's final things go to Andrews. New president's things begin to be brought over from Blair House, which is half a block away, the official residence where the, new pre the incoming president has during the transition period. But once the oath of office is given, the things begin to be taken over to the White House. You see, that is why you have to have a long inaugural parade. <laughs> because they are moving the stuff. And you don't want the new president to the White House until the bathrobes are on the back of the bathroom wall, pictures are on the piano, clothes are in the closet, and then there is a complete change of government. I went from that moment to Wheaton. <laughs> And it was such a wonderful landing, a place of intelligent people, great students then, and I hear you're even better now, that out of 3,400, you are the chosen uh, who actually got admitted. And so it's a nice time for me to come back. There have been many course corrections in my life. And I think the thing you can do is say, what can I do today that give me more options for the future. And being at Wheaton is one of those that will give you more options. I also think that learning leadership will give you more options. And I think the best ways to learn leadership are practice and the use of the critical eye. Now when I say practice, what I'm really trying to focus on is that we begin in college, preferably, to try the skills of leadership. I look back and people have said to me, how did you get to be a leader? And the truth is, in very traditional ways. Uh, I was the drum major for the Canyon Junior High Band. I was the president of the Future Homemakers of America. <laughs> I was the secretary of the student body at the small liberal arts college where I was educated. I was the secretary of my class in law school. But the truth is, in traditional ways, I was trying to learn to do something that women had not traditionally done. And that was to be the leaders. Now, I think in some ways we have come so far. I love a cartoon. I saw a family circus series. And it's a little girl, little boy in a backyard. And the boy has on the stethoscope, and he's holding the doctor's kit. And the little girl says, OK, you can be the doctor. I'll be the Secretary of Health and Human Services. <laughs> and so I think there is an expanded notion of what is possible. I think for the women of the past, there is a great saying, and Dara Gandhi was the one I heard it from. And she said, I have felt like a bird born in too small a cage. And so the years have been trying to push back barriers and walls, sometimes of law, sometimes of attitude, sometimes of self-limitation. Two days ago, I was in a conference at the University of Texas in Austin with Muriel Siebert, who was the first woman to have a chair on the New York Stock Exchange. And she was talking about how it was hard for her to start and how she had done that, what she's done since. And we had a group of students who were part of that conversation. And at one point, I was, of course, keeping notes. There had been five people who had participated. One of them participated twice. Four were men, including the one who participated twice, and one was a woman. And she participated because she had been to see me a couple of weeks ago, and I looked around and saw her, and I gave her one of those looks that says, you better say something. <laughs> um, but. But it was not to be critical of the men. As I said to the group there, 
the men were participating. That's what you should do. But the women were waiting to participate. Or for example, if I look at debates I do on women's issues, and they open it for people to come up and ask questions, a lot of time they will open it up with two um, microphones in the aisle. And if you will watch, about 10 deep on both microphones will be men, and then a few women right behind them. I'm not critical of the men. It's just they have learned that if you want to ask a question, get up and go get in line. And the women will sit in their seats till they figure out the perfect question. And then they go get in line. And that you never get to them. So it's like one of the things that we're working on is getting people to participate instead of hanging back. I think part of that is practicing leadership. Through opportunities here, through opportunities in your communities, clubs, all kinds of ways. But I think practicing leadership. Practice means you don't have to be perfect. I don't know if any of you do what I do, but sometimes I hold myself back if I'm not sure I can do something perfectly. Uh, when I left the White House, I went skiing. Uh, now, there are a lot of jokes about Texans who ski, and I'm not going to tell any of them. <laughs> but most of you probably ski very well. I hadn't. So I took lessons, snow skiing, of course. And they taught me how to parallel the skis, and then you bring your shoulder around, and you dip, and you do all this stuff. And finally got to the bottom of the hill, and they sent me up on the baby slope to come back. And so I did that. It took me all afternoon because uh, I was trying so hard to be perfect. I probably made about 000 0.1 mile an hour progress. But I finally got down to the bottom, and I said to the instructor, I have come all the way down, and I did not fall once. And he said to me, then you're never going to be any good. And he said, the only people who are ever good are the ones who can go, who are willing to go a little faster than they know how to control, but who, if they fall down, have learned how to get up. Now, I am not trying to get you to do what I saw some on the slopes doing. And that was coming off the top of the hill, yelling, help, I can't ski, and just <laughs> right down. I think they were probably trying to get me to move. <laughs> But I am saying that one of the best things I have learned is to go a little faster than I know how to control. But also, if I fall down, to know how to get up. I think practice is partly using the critical eye. And by that, I don't mean for you just to be critical, but for you to watch what people do. For example, I learned a lot about speaking simply by watching. I read a speech one time. And there was a doctor named Albert Sabin who did the Sabin polio vaccine. He was on the same panel. And he came up afterwards and he said, Sarah, a speech read is like a kiss over the telephone. It may mean the same, but it sure doesn't feel it. And so I got to watching people do speeches. And the ones who did not read were better than those who did. You've seen it. It's like this. Leadership. Leadership is important in today's society. A key ingredient of leadership is communication. Communication is enhanced by eye contact, et cetera, et cetera. But I learned people who didn't read their speeches were better. And so I tried to figure out how to do that. Now, for a long time, I would use an outline and now use a very small outline, but learn by watching other people. I think people who use humor are better than those who don't. And so I've been trying to watch how to use humor. Now, you, most of you are too young to remember, but when Ronald Reagan was shot, he was carried to the emergency room, he was about to go into surgery, Nancy was bending over him, and he looked up and he said, I'm just praying those doctors are Republicans. <laughs> it was one of those one-liners that nobody could have given him on a three-by-five card. He just had a sense of using humor. Or, for example, I heard Bob Hope one time. He was giving a speech to a graduating senior group. And it would have been something like this if it had been today. He said, you are going into the worst economic environment our country has ever had. Things are worse today than they have been in 48 years. The chance of your getting a job is not too good. Look at the international situation. Look at the environmental situation. It is a difficult world you're going into. And then he said, the world is out there waiting for you. Don't 
go. And isn't there a sense, I mean, I heard one of the people at, at the uh, dinner say, um, you know, it's such a bad economic time, you ought to just stay here another year. And I thought, you know, there's some ways that's right. But I tried to learn to use humor. Or, for example, um, you can always tell humor on yourself. I went to Jimmy Carter's birthday party a few years ago and really was excited. I, I thought he was a great president. I love what he, one of my friends says. He is the only president who has used the presidency as a stepping stone to doing more important things. And there's so much I value about what he has done. I knew I was going to see him and friends, and I knew Kirk Douglas was going to be the MC. Now, most of you know he is Michael Douglas's father. Um, <laughs> And he has this really cute dimple. Um, and I just thought it'd be fun to have my picture taken with Kirk Douglas. So I go to the party. I meet Kirk Douglas. He is, in fact, really nice. He is this tall. <laughs> I could not have a picture that would show I was larger than Spartacus. <laughs> But I learned that people who could use humor were better. And so I started trying to figure out how to do it. Or for example, I saw people who used one lines. And there's some great one liners. Barbara Jordan said, to be a leader, you must be comfortable feeling different. And I think that's true. Now I tried to figure out why Barbara Jordan was such an effective speaker. I'm not gonna be Barbara Jordan. I can't do it the same way she did it, but I tried to figure out why I responded to what she was saying. And part of it was she slowed down instead of speeding up. For example, if I were Barbara Jordan, I would do a speech like this. The Constitution. The Constitution is a document. A document that guarantees equality. Equality. It says that blah blah. I can't do it like her, but I can appreciate what she did and try to learn from it. And I've learned at the end of my speech, that's why I'm having Ashley time me so I can leave out stuff in the middle if I need to. But I can use my ending and to slow down at the end, not speed up. There are many ways I've learned leadership, but part of it is being involved in very important issues I cared a great deal about. You see, if anybody had looked at me sitting out in your seats in my undergraduate setting, if anybody had said which one of these students will try a US Supreme Court case, which one of these students will be in the White House, which one of these students will write a book, nobody would have guessed it would be me. And I didn't guess it would be me. I didn't know what my issues would be. But I wanted to learn to be a leader. Now, there are lots of definitions about leadership. For example, Micah Corda said, leadership is the ability to set an organization to music, the music to which it will dance. Former President Harry Truman said, um, leaders are people who can get others to do what they don't want to do and like it. My personal definition is that leadership is the ability to leave your thumbprint. It's to leave that impression. Some have said leadership and concern for others is the rent you pay for your space on earth. But I really believe that we have the obligation as well as the opportunity to try to make a difference and make things better for others. Now, I was just thinking about the most difficult speech I've had recently. It was a really difficult speech. It was for Microsoft Corporation. They're human relations people. That wasn't the hard part. Richard Simmons was following me. <laughs> I had more substance. He had more glitter. <laughs> but I got to thinking about, he's made an impact about something he really cares about. It's not the way I would do it. It's not the same issue, maybe. But leadership to me is the ability to leave your thumbprint. I became a leader on women's issues because those were the ones that most affected me and my generation. And so we were often told women can't, women don't, women shouldn't. And we were saying, just watch. 
It was at a garage sale that that group of women approached me and said, Sarah, we need help. Would you do some research for us? Now, if they had said to me, Sarah, would you mind doing a U.S. Supreme Court case? I would have said, no way. But they asked me to research, and I knew how to do that. And so I went to the library and started looking it up. I found the changes that had happened in New York State. I found changes that had happened in Colorado. I found the changes that had happened in California. One of the oddities of history is that the California legislature in 67 had changed the California law so abortion was essentially legal. And then Governor of California Ronald Reagan had signed that bill into law. It was later when he ran for president that he became so opposed to the issue of abortion. But a lot of women didn't have the money to go those places. And so these women had gathered information about where the good places were and where the terrible places were. And their question was, can we tell people? Could we tell people where to go? Could we tell it to the campus newspaper? Could we tell it to a radio station? Or would we be prosecuted as accomplices? Now, the reason that question came up was because of a case called Griswold versus Connecticut, out of Connecticut, in which Connecticut had a law that said the use of contraception is a criminal offense. And so a woman who was head of the New Haven Planned Parenthood with her doctor, Lee Buxton, had given a contraceptive device to a married couple. They were arrested, prosecuted, and convicted of being accomplices to the crime of the use of a contraceptive device. And it was that case that eventually got to the U.S. Supreme Court, 1965, and the court ruled that there is a right of privacy in the U.S. Constitution that includes the decision of whether to bear or begat a child. And so once I found that, it was the perfect springboard to look at challenging the Texas anti-abortion statute. Now, there's a lot to filing a case, and I'm going to skip a lot, but answer any questions you want. But come with me now to the night before I'm getting ready to argue Roe versus Wade. I went back in writing a book not too long ago and asked the women why they had come to me, because, as Tish told you, I had done uncontested divorces, wills for people with no money, and one adoption for my uncle. That was my entire legal experience. And I am getting ready to have my first contested case in the U.S. Supreme Court. Let me borrow your book a second. Um, I was so nervous. This is uh, the picture of me, my husband, my mother, uh, the day of oral argument. Uh, Laura, Betty Friedan was there in the courtroom. She said that her historic Geiger counter was clicking, and she knew it would be something important happening. But you can see I really look so young. Um, and I'm going to skip ahead to tell you one quick story, and I'll, oh, I'll tell you what, hold that. No, nope, yours. And I'll, I'll come back to that and say, night before oral argument. You know how you are when something really important is going to happen the next day, and your mind won't turn off. And I would go to bed and think, what if they ask such and such? Get up and check my notes, be sure I had it. I had taken a legal manila folder. And you know how you have a, well, I did, you may not. I had a lot of those eight by five cards left from English composition. And so I had taped those in, like First Amendment, Fourth Amendment, Eighth Amendment, Ninth Amendment. I could flip on both sides of the whole thing. I knew everything. And I would go to bed and think, what if they ask such and such? Get up and check it, go back to bed. Get up. My mind would not turn off. Because I wanted to be so sure there was nothing those judges could ask that I wouldn't know. Rehnquist asked one question I did not know. The question was, when was Texas readmitted to the Union? <laughs> Had never occurred to me I needed that. <laughs> and if you don't know, you say, I'm sorry, Your Honor, I don't know. I will go home, look it up, and send it in on a supplemental brief. Now, my students ask if they can file supplementals after finals. <laughs> They can't. And then over to the Supreme Court. I went early. I'd gone the day before just to see where to stand and how it all operates. And I went over to the court early. There were lines of people already forming. Into the doors of the Supreme Court, you know those marble steps, you've seen the pictures, that lead up to that platform, columns that reach into the sky, and you go in the doors of the U.S. Supreme Court. 
down a corridor almost this wide with marble busts and niches as you pass, former Chief Justices looking at you in marble. And you go now through security, then it wasn't true, and into the doors of the chamber, which holds 300 people. It has an intimate feel. And, and you go in, and you're in this room. You have to go through red velvet curtains, very heavy curtains. And then you see three sections of what look like church pews with fancy padding. On the left is called the three-minute section. It's for the tourists. So the entire time you're doing oral argument, every three minutes, a group comes in, a group goes out, a group comes in, and the curtains are to hold down on the noise. Then you have two sections, first come, first serve, for people who want to hear the entire oral argument, only they're very strict. You cannot chew gum, you can't take notes, you can't whisper, you can't put your arm on the back of the seat, or the sergeants will come and tell you not to. But two sections for people, first come, first serve. A gold railing that separates laymen from lawyers. If you're admitted to U.S. Supreme Court practice, there are some sort of ornate chairs for you to sit in while hearing the argument. And then two tables for the counsel, because they'll hear the court hears two cases each session. So one at 10, one at 11 in the morning, one at 2, one at 3 in the afternoon. And as you take your place, there are handmade goose quill pens. Uh, one for each counsel who will argue. It is for you to take as a souvenir for having argued in the Supreme Court because so few people ever get to do that. When you're getting ready to argue on the left is the section for the press, absolutely packed. On the right is the section for family and friends of the justices, absolutely packed. No further than from me to you would be the Chief Justice and then the other judges on either side. Above the Chief Justice is this huge clock so you can watch the minutes of your oral argument ticking by. 30 minutes per side, one hour per case. You're in this room with 13 kinds of marble, marble columns along the side, a very high ceiling with gold, gilt, blues, greens, those very vivid colors. And when it's time for the court to start, the marshal comes out in striped pants and cutaway tails and says, in essence, Oh, yay, oh, yay, oh, yay, all ye please rise and face the court. And those curtains behind the bench part. The judges are silhouetted in their black robes, and they start marching in. I had a friend who said there was organ music playing in the vestibule. <laughs> that was not true, but it was awesome. And once the judges were in place, put their briefs on the table, on the bench, Justice Berger, then Chief Justice, said, Miss Weddington, if you're ready, you may begin. There were three key issues in the case. One, whether pregnancy was fundamental. Second, whether there is a right of privacy in the U.S. Constitution. And third, whether the state had a compelling reason to regulate. The Supreme Court will generally not overturn state statutes unless it's about something very important. And so the issue was, is pregnancy fundamental? And we could show at that point that in most high schools, if a woman became pregnant, she was forced to quit, not allowed to continue. Young men not forced to quit if they were involved in a pregnancy, but the young woman was. Uh, uh, women teachers were for uh, so many impacts of pregnancy. Second, is there a right of privacy in the Constitution? And we were arguing that when you talked about you have a right to be protected in your search for liberty, that nothing was more important for women than to have the liberty to make their own decisions. And the issue of, did the state have a compelling reason to regulate? The state was saying that it was looking at potential life and trying to save potential life, except the state hadn't done it in any way except the anti-abortion statutes. For example, and neither had the federal government. Uh, we could show that if you had a child born on January 1, 19, well, 2002, you didn't get a tax deduction for 2001. It was not the year you were pregnant or got pregnant. It was the year in which a birth occurred that you got the deduction. That people in Mexico or other countries who came across the border to give birth because citizenship 
is available for those who were born in the U.S. or naturalized, all citizens. Uh, that in Texas, uh, there were no laws that considered the fetus a person. Uh, and so the state did, in our opinion, could not meet its burden of proof. We left the court not knowing whether we had won or lost. Running for the legislature, because I thought if I lose it in the court, I can do something uh, in the legislature. And so I'd just been elected to the legislature, and on the morning of January 22nd, 1973, you'll note 30 years from this coming January, I was over at the Capitol and the phone rang. It was a reporter from the New York Times. And the reporter said to my assistant, does Miss Weddington have a comment today about Roe versus Wade? And my assistant said, should she? <laughs> And the reporter said, it was decided today. And my assistant said, how was it decided? <laughs> and the words came back, she won it, seven to two. Um, time and a minute later I got a telegram from the Supreme Court telling me I'd won and that they were mailing a copy of the opinion. It was collect. Uh, I don't remember what I had to pay to get it but I was happy to do it. If you had said to me that day 30 years from now you will still be talking about this I would never have believed it. If anybody had said to me on an exam question Will students in 2002 still have to deal with this issue? I would have said no. We'll have to get clinics established. We'll have to get doctors who are able to provide abortion. But 30 years from now, this will be one of the things that we recognize women have a right to make decisions and we'll be working on other issues. And here we are, and I was wrong. Because when I think about what the future holds for women, I think we've made progress in many ways. I look at sports and I see women doing fantastic things. The soccer team uh, for the United States and all they accomplished. And then I see, help, help me with the pronunciation, Capriati, Jennifer Capriati. And did you see where she was asked in the last month, what about Title IX, which was the vehicle that gave opportunities to women in sports? And she said, I don't know what that is. I want her to have those opportunities, but I want her to know it took an effort to get there. I think about so many things that have happened. We haven't solved the problems, frankly, but I think about all that's happened and I know we need new leaders to help. Do you realize I got the telegram because it was before the internet? It was before the fax machine? It was before LexisNexis. It was history. But I was giving a speech not long ago, and a young woman introduced me. She was a young lawyer, and she said, I never met Sarah Weddington until tonight, but I am her daughter in law. And I thought how much we need sons and daughters who are willing to leave their thumbprint and look at how they can make the world better. When I went to Washington for the 25th anniversary of Roe, I went over to the Vietnam Veterans Memorial. It happens to be a place where my cousin's name is on the wall, and I always go see him. He was my favorite cousin. Um, but I went this time also to the, to, the, to the Korean War Memorial, and the words on it say, freedom is not free. And I believe that the freedom to make your own decisions, the freedom to participate in a world that is safe, that has environmental quality, is not free. And that there is much we wish we could have achieved, but which we leave to you. I have so enjoyed being a woman in leadership positions and being able to leave my thumbprint. The hard for, part for me is, as Tish and I were talking today, what do you do for an encore when you have created a judicial earthquake when you're in your 20s? 
And so the best I know to do is to share my experiences, to share my wisdom, and essentially to pass a torch. I pass it to you, the students of Wheaton. I hope you will find your place of leadership. And I hope you will find as much satisfaction in life, not without difficulty, not without disappointing moments, not without some moguls and some waves to cross, but I hope you find as much satisfaction in leaving your thumbprint as I have. Thank you. That's a little hot, a little stuffy. Some of you may have papers you have to write. When you need to leave, just go. We understand. Stay as long as you can. Jonah, I, you just happened to be one who came to the dinner, and you were kind to visit with me, so I know your name. Um, would you please decide who asked the questions, and I will answer them. Okay. But you have to stand up to do that. Okay. <laughs> your question. Uh, I don't know. This issue about poisonous reminds me of something Michael Novo is happy to have a book on the Bush administration of stupid white men. Um, but how the Republicans were very against stem cell research that might be against conception. Then I'm writing on Alzheimer's. And then you have Thurman and Cheney saying, well, it's okay in some cases. Uh, Moore said the uh, model became, forget the younger one, say the giver. I was just wondering if there's any chance um, that some incident or swing in the Republican Party could make them turn away from this far religious right. You know, there are so many people who I think, and you're obviously well read, um, I, I think there are so many people in the Republican Party who believe very much in stem cell research and the potential that has for Parkinson's, for all kinds of things. Um, certainly Christopher Reeves, I don't know if he's Democrat or Republican, but he's certainly worked very hard to say we need this kind of research. It is a hope for many people. Uh, and so I do think the majority of people believe that it's research that ought to be done. I believe the majority of Republicans, as well as the majority of Democrats, think it is research that ought to be done. But I think we have a system that allows people who are smaller in number but more vocal in what they say because of the primaries, that you have power out of proportion to your numbers in the primary. So I do not believe during the current administration that that larger number of people will have the final word. I think the administration is determined it has to reach out to a certain group who may be small in numbers but very vocal, both on stem cell and on the issue of abortion. Uh, and so I think they're tied to that position. I don't think it will change until who's in the White House changes. Okay. Johnny, you decide. And I'll tell you why, because I, I will be answering one person, and I don't see anybody else. So it's easier for me if somebody else just decides who. So you just keep scanning the room and tell me who. Mm -hmm. All right, tough choice, so. <laughs> Good question. Okay. Question is... What do you think the future for Roe versus Wade most likely is, with Bush especially appointing the Supreme Court? I worry about it. Um, so I'm very active right now trying to help campaign for U.S. Senate candidates who are pro-choice. You all know that there is a one-vote margin in the U.S. Senate. Democrats have the Senate by one vote and therefore control the Senate Judiciary Committee only because of that one vote. So the Republican Party, and especially Karl Rove, has decided that they want the party back in Republican, uh, they want the Senate back in Republican hands because that way they would control who the Senate Judiciary Committee confirms. Now, I think there are several members of the U.S. Supreme Court who might, in the next couple of years, decide to resign. Uh, Rehnquist is now mid-70s. Um, his wife died a few years ago. Um, there's been a lot of talk about lower back pain and some things. 
But I don't think he's going to leave while the Senate is controlled by the Democrats. I think he'll wait till this next election. And then I do think in the next two years he'll probably look at that more seriously. Um, there has been some rumor Sandra Day O'Connor might be considering retirement. But I think um, there have been some rumors more recently that she thinks she might have a chance to be appointed Chief Justice if Rehnquist left because it would give Bush a chance to appoint the first woman Chief Justice of the United States, and he would not appoint uh, Ginsburg. So I think it's fairly well assumed it would be O'Connor if he were to appoint a woman, um, unless he brought in somebody outside the court, but I think he'd be more likely to take somebody on it. And Stevens is now in his 80s. Uh, he has been the person on the court the longest. He has been our friend on the choice issue for a long time. But his wife has not been well, and so I do think he's thinking about it. Okay, let's assume someone leaves the U.S. Supreme Court. President gets that appointment. John Ashcroft is the Attorney General. Uh, and there, he has said in the past that the one thing he would most like to do as part of public service is overturn Roe versus Wade. So I'm sure he has a list of people uh, who would be justices from that point of view that could be confirmed, or that could be appointed, not confirmed. So who gets appointed, but more importantly, who gets confirmed is up to who controls the Senate. There's not a more important issue for Roe versus Wade than what senators get elected this November. We are days away from that election. And so when people say to me, what can I do to help save Roe versus Wade, I say, vote for pro-choice candidates uh, in that November election for the Senate, because that's going to decide what the future is going to be. And I'm very worried about what's going to happen in November. Uh, sort of on that same notion, it, even though abortion is illegal, it seems almost no longer that it's not existed because so many, I mean, more and more offices and clinics are still good, not just because of political pressure, but you know, outside anti-abortion mm -hmm. You know, it is such a difficult thing to try to deal with. I'm told now that there's a website where a certain person who's opposed to abortion has been going to Planned Parenthood clinics and trying to take pictures of every woman who goes into the clinic. Now, he would have no idea what she's going in for. It's just if you go in the clinic, he takes your picture and puts it on the website. Um, we are trying to react against a lot of people who are picketing Especially very now, there's some they have a right of free speech within a certain amount of space, but they don't have a right to intimidate. They don't have a right to accost people. There have been some litigation brought in other places. There have been some new laws proposed that that, uh, for example, the one in Congress that was passed was the clinic entrances bill, which provides it's a federal crime. And under Janet Reno, there really had been some enforcement. I will not say there's no enforcement against John Ashcroft, uh, from John Ashcroft, but I, I can say I think the enthusiasm in that office has dimmed considerably. Um, we are also looking at young doctors learning to do procedures. There are now medical students for choice, organizations at a lot of medical schools. Planned Parenthoods are offering to teach the techniques. There is a huge fight going on right now in the medical community over whether or not law, uh, medical schools ought to teach abortion for those who want to learn. And most of the professional organizations have said yes, it is important for doctors to learn all procedures. Um, so there are so many things to do. There are a number of Planned Parenthoods in different places that have formed organizations of younger people to work to help. Clinic defense uh, in places uh, can be very important. Uh, the, particularly women, some men, who've also done clinic defense, uh, tell me that once you do that, once the opposition yells at you, once you see the way they treat women trying to come to the clinics, you will never, never quit fighting for the principle of choice. Um, so I think there is a lot that we have to do, including express appreciation to doctors and those who work at clinics. Um, it's going to be a lot of legal and um, political battles to be fought. <laughs> um, I have a question on the Sure. Um, I actually work in the Washington Medical Center in Alabama, and I can say that it's, it's scary to go to work sometimes, and I just, I'll never stop fighting. It's just, we found a knife in our recovery room the other day, which is scary, but um, you said we 
You know, and one of the things I think is those who are pro-choice never picket, never threaten those who are anti. And so I get so angry. And not all people who are anti are at the clinics are making, you know, some of them are protesting in very legitimate ways, but there are so many that are really trying hard to instill that fear. And so it's one of those things that we can't give in. Yes. And I know some of these are stating the paper why that's not the need, but it would seem it would be the easier way to um, have an abortion. And what is stopping? I mean, okay. Most doctors can describe it. Yeah. It's illegal and it's yeah. successful, but they're going to have to walk the bottom. But and what has happened is. RU46, which I still call it Mifcristone, if you're being more formal, has been used in Europe for a long time. First, it was hard for us to even get it here because the FDA wasn't approving it. And finally, we got it approved. Then we had to find somebody who would manufacture it. And those opposed to abortion had said to all the drug companies, if you manufacture this, we're going to pick up all of your products. So eventually, we found a company not in the US to manufacture it. Now what's happened? is that there are various places where they are trying again to challenge the availability of its uh, three pills and then a follow-up injection. So a lot of women are saying it takes longer, uh, that it actually right now is more expensive, $400 compared to $250 or so usually for the traditional surgical, that it takes longer to have the series of pills and so on rather than one surgical procedure. So I think for right now it's having a very slow start. Eventually, I think it's going to be more available, but I think it's just people haven't known about it, takes longer, more expensive, and they're just unsure about it uh, because, again, lots of publicity about whether it's safe or not. Eventually, it'll be more used, but not right now. Sure. Yeah. What did I hope we would be working on at this point? Well, I think there are a number of things. Um, one is if we still, uh, Tish and I were talking this afternoon, because the child care situation is still a real problem in this country. Not enough good quality child care, too expensive for many people. There are a lot of issues around children uh, that I would think women would be really working on. Um, I think there are lots of issues about women who are aging. Uh, you look at so many women who are older than I. Um, and so security often is not quite enough for them. Uh, they don't have access to medications through Medicare. Uh, there are a lot of older women living in real poverty. And so I think there's a lot to be done there. I think there are a lot of issues that deal with women still not being in leadership positions in a number of areas. For example, we have a few more women in the House and Senate in Congress, but it's still a real small number. Uh, 13 women in the U.S. Senate out of 100. Uh, if you look at corporate, now frankly, right now, I'm just happy there are not more women CEOs. Uh, I'm glad they are the whistleblowers. Um, but, but long term, you want more women in those kinds of positions, and there are very few. You look at diplomatic or world, I mean, there are other countries that have prime ministers, but we have so few women. Uh, Condi Rice, you could say, is an important woman in international events. But there are so few, given the number of diplomats and so on. Uh, so I still keep seeing this. Uh, we used to talk about it as the glass ceiling, uh, that it made it hard for women to go above that area. But now I think it's more, I don't know, a concrete ceiling. And the worse the job market is, the worse the economy is, the harder it is for new people to rise through those barriers. So I worry about those barriers. I worry about women and money. Uh, most of the, the studies show that women who are middle-aged and over don't know much about managing money. Now you will see the statistic that says most of the money in this country is owned by women. Widows some, um, people who've inherited money, a lot of money is owned by women. It's not managed by women. 
And so, again, if you look at who the names are in these financial institutions, there haven't been a whole lot of them. Uh, and, and women are going to have more. I want all of you to learn to manage well. I hope you will eventually have lots of it. But whatever you have, learn to manage it well. Because it, it is so important these days and times. And then I think there are more general issues. I see some of my students who care deeply about environmental issues, and they're going to work on those. Uh, I see others who really work about issues of equality from a racial point of view or from other points of view. I think that's really important. I, it's not so much that I think there's any one, two, three issues to work on. It's to find what really is your passion. I see some who are working on various diseases because they've had a family member, somebody they really cared about, affected. Um, I see some of my students doing Habitat for Humanity, which I think is fantastic. I wish we had good housing. Um, so I think there are lots of issues out there, but to me there's still the issues of how do you get women to move up through those various leadership ranks. Let's do, what do you think Jason, one more question, two? Jonah. Oh. Okay, let's do two. I think it's turn out the vote, work with candidates that you favor, and ask them how you can help on get out the vote efforts. Because you don't have to be a certain age to help do that. And there are lots of those kind of volunteer things for parties, for candidates who are pro-choice. And that's what I would do from now to the election. After that, I think it's supporting some of the traditional organizations that are very pro-choice. Okay, last question. Um, I find, from my experience as candidate, that within my generation, a lot of women are um, being in opposition. I'm not sure everybody can hear. Can you uh, all hear in the back? There, in my generation, there have been a lot of women that have been in opposition to equal rights amendment, to you know, a lot of the black feeling of their place in the world. Sometimes I think that comes with more self-image or what they were taught. If you can do a brief uh, explanation or defense of a woman's right to choose, uh, when I was explaining mm -hmm. earlier about C-SPAN, there was some callers coming in and she was saying, you know, I'm a mother and I'm a whatever, whatever. And her opinion was that she was totally opposed to it because if you choose to have sex, you have to suffer the repercussions. You would choose, you know, go stream the television. What, if you were to say, what would be your closing argument to, to approach somebody like that that was closed, but to begin to open their mind about what this really means? Um, first, I'd have to admit defeat in some cases. There are some people you could talk to them until you are blue in the face, and it would not make any difference. But I think there are a lot more people who don't know, who are undecided, or who are trying to weigh things. I think you'd make a difference with them. And I think there's a lot you can do to keep the pro-choice side energized. And so basically I would say, <laughs> basically I would say, thank you very much, Jonah. Um, I have come from a foreign land. I have come from a land when, where women were told that women could be teachers, secretaries, or nurses. I have come from a land where women were hobbled either in their feet or because they could only run two dribbles and after that it was a violation. I have come from a land where women had no reproductive decisions of their own to make. I have come from a land where women could not get credit in their own name. I have come from a land where there were very few opportunities for women to rise in leadership. I left that land, and happily so. I ask you to maintain this new world and be sure that we never again return to a world where women are born into too small a cage. Let them fly free.